Okay, thank you for the opportunity to present our work from the Radboud Center for Infectious Diseases on antibiotic resistance, in particular in the primary healthcare uh, sector. As you all know, that already Fleming, who discovered uh, penicillin, already predicted that at a time when people could buy antibiotics in the shops around the corner, that the resistance issue would rise and actually infection would become untreatable. And that's the current situation that we see, particularly in hospitals, but also much more also in the primary healthcare setting. And if you look at a more global uh, context, we see actually that the burden of resistance is really in the more low resource uh, settings, particularly in Asia and in Africa, but also still in Europe, we see a huge issue with antibiotic resistance on the rise. And we see also now infections in the hospital that are still more difficult uh, to treat and with often poor outcome uh, for the patient. So this is not a future problem. This is a problem that we really see now. And also in the primary healthcare setting, I work in a hospital, but we do also a lot of studies in a community setting, in a primary healthcare setting. And what are the possibilities to work on? And first, it's all really about knowing how big is the issue, both in the primary healthcare setting, but also in the agricultural setting and in the hospital setting. Uh, so surveillance is crucial for both antibiotic resistance, but also on antibiotic use. That is one aspect of it and a very important one to have really good proper surveillance to be able to do benchmarking. The, and also in the primary healthcare setting, you see very nice examples that GP practices now can, for instance, benchmark uh, based on syndromes for, for instance, pneumonia or re acute respiratory infection or urinary tract infection. How does one GP prescribe versus another GP? And you can have discussions around that and try to improve and learn uh, from each other. And there's some nice examples around the world on that. Then the other aspect is on about decreasing uh, the use of antibiotics, for instance, uh, by actually uh, reducing the incidence of infections due to uh, by actually vaccination. Also here, GPs are, of course, very important. Thinking about Haemophilus influenzae vaccination or Pneumococcus vaccination um, to actually uh, decrease these kind of infections and thus uh, making sure that we don't need antibiotics to treat these infections anymore, actually by preventing them, but also other measures like sanitation, uh, clean water access are very crucial. In Europe, generally, this is available everywhere, but of course, this is a very big issue in the low resource settings. The other aspect, which is also very important in the primary healthcare sector, is about using antibiotics properly, uh, particularly in respiratory infections. This is always an issue, and there are now uh, initiatives regarding rapid testing for C erective protein to actually to help decide does this patient need an antibiotic or not. And I'll give an example of a study that we have did, done on this aspect, but also very simple guidelines and making sure that people adhere to these guidelines also in the primary healthcare sector. And that we try to really uh, do the same and treat patients in the same way and try to avoid antibiotics when we don't uh, need them. And then the other aspect that we need to focus on, but this is more outside the scope of this talk, is the use in agriculture, uh, for instance. And all these aspects are both on a local level, in your own practice, but also in your region. Try to really work together and discuss issues and learn from each other, but also national, looking at policies or how the insurance actually reimburses uh, health aspects, which are uh, important to uh, controlling resistance. Thinking, for instance, about prevention, which is often very difficult to actually get reimbursed uh, these kinds of activities. Then I really want to focus in this talk is really about the inappropriate use of antibiotics, in, in particular in the primary healthcare uh, setting. Uh, what we see is that often there's a, yeah, does this patient with this syndrome, the patient has fever, the uh, patient has maybe a runny nose, the patient is coughing, does this patient actually need an antibiotic or not? And particularly in the primary healthcare sector where there's very little access to diagnostics or it's actually used in a restricted manner, uh, which is of course very different than uh, we have in the hospital situation, is that uh, the etiology is often unknown. And for this reason, you see there's now actually more use for instance, for instance, rather than looking at the pathogen to start to look more at the biomarkers, uh, does this patient have an inflammatory response that uh, uh, shows that this patient has likely 
an, a bacterial infection or an infection that would require an antibiotic, that this is probably more the way that we should go. Um, but if you do have microbiology or you do have access to, to, to laboratory uh, facilities, and often it also always takes time that the patient comes to you with a potentially urinary tract infection, uh, but it takes time before you know, are there bacteria in the urine? If they are there, which one is it? And if it's, uh, if it's known which one, then it also takes more time to actually get an antibiogram. And also when you have the antibiogram, you see many different kinds of susceptibilities. And then it's often known, okay, if there are more antibiotics uh, potentially possible to treat the infection, which one should I pick? Which is the best one? Which antibiotic does, uh, does not lead to the most resistance? So there's more discussion, how can I actually communicate our results faster, but also in a simpler way that helps you as a GP to prescribe the right antibiotic, and not just for the patient, but also in a more ecological fashion that actually prevents further resistance to develop. Then the other aspect is that once you do know that you should prescribe an antibiotic, actually uh, the, the choice, we just uh, discussed that, but also then at what dose and for how long. And there's uh, been a lot of discussion now based on the BMJ paper from the Oxford group discussing about uh, the, the course of antibiotics had had its day. You can treat uh, short or when the patient feels better, the patient should stop. We really do not recommend this approach because what do you do with the leftover antibiotics? And can the patient really decide him or herself when or he should or, uh, not stop? So it, we do need more studies to look at can the duration be uh, shortened? Uh, of, uh, and we have already had done that in many different kinds of uh, uh, infectious disease syndromes. And uh, we do see that in the future probably you'll learn more. Can you maybe dose a bit higher and therefore maybe the course will be shorter? that in due time, uh, more studies will be done to have more evidence. What is the exact duration that you need for this specific infection for this patient? And now a bit more uh, on what we do at uh, the Radboud University Medical Center uh, in the Center for Infectious Diseases. So we really try to work on the full scope. So I have a really a large group of infectious disease professionals uh, working both on the prevention, but also on the diagnostics of infectious diseases on the treatments so or antibiotic stewardship in particular, but also on the health economics. Because if we do think there's a good intervention, but it's too costly and the sort of the benefits are not so large, does it really matter that much? And should we not prioritize other things? So we really try to look at a more fuller picture, which also brings us more to the implementation science and also into the policies and also on a national level, but also on a more uh, international level. We do discuss also with WHO on uh, how to approach the problem of um, AMR. And with the expertise that we have here and, and, and the knowledge from the Netherlands regarding antibiotic use and, 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 and diagnostic testing and different kinds of strategies, uh, we have, have different kinds of master classes uh, that uh, professionals can uh, uh, participate in. And one is upcoming in May 2020. I'll show the slide later on antimicrobial stewardship uh, in an international uh, context. And we really try to do everything in a global health context. And uh, from uh, a request, I will uh, point out two different projects that we do or are involved in. One that's already uh, finished on c protein testing in the primary healthcare setting. So we do see that a lot of antibiotics uh, that are used in the primary healthcare are for respiratory infections. But many of these infections, as you all will know, are viral and do not need antibiotics, but if the patient comes to you, uh, you don't want to see the patient really again, you want to send them home. And I do understand that often uh, it's quite simple and easy then just to give the patient a prescription, but this in the end will lead that we can uh, not treat the infections, the true infections anymore at some point in time. So can we really help the GP better when and when not to prescribe and um, an antibiotic for acute respiratory infection, particularly the non-severe infections. And the C-reactive protein, which is a biomarker, an inflammatory marker, um, there are now very nice and very good point of care tests that uh, can give a result within a couple of minutes by a finger prick uh, blood test. And if the, uh, the result, and you can discuss about the different uh, the levels that we need to decide, particularly for children versus adults, um, there are a lot of issues about that, but we have done a study both in children and in adults. 
in, uh, in a Vietnamese setting. This is, of course, not a setting that uh, is similar as in Europe, but also in European studies that do show that c protein testing, particularly rapid testing in the GP practice, can bring down antibiotic use. Uh, even in the Netherlands, which also already has a very restricted antibiotic policy, we even see in that situation, by nice studies done by the Maastricht group, that antibiotics can even be br brought down further in the Netherlands, uh, where use is already quite limited. So this study we wanted to study in the Vietnamese setting. Does it help in a GP practice? Uh, does it come at a cost? And if so, how much? And actually, how are people using it? Do the people accept it? How about the, the prescriber versus the, uh, the client or the, uh, the patient? And in the study, as you see in this graph, we see overall in 10 uh, health stations, so actually 10 uh, GP practices, that antibiotic use, particularly at the first visit, uh, can be brought down quite considerably, like 20%, which is on a national scale a large amount. In the end, people do visit and go to pharmacies anyway and get antibiotics later. So in the end, at day 14, uh, we do see that the impact is less. But if you see, look at this, um, graph, you see the different health stations, the 10 health stations depicted. On the left side of the dashed line, uh, the CRP test has an impact. On the right side, uh, the CRP test does not have an impact. And, these, and if you see actually that in quite a lot of stations, the impact is quite considerable. You can bring it down uh, a lot. But there were two that actually uh, we did not see any impact. And it was particularly because these stations had already a lot of antibiotics on stock and they want to dispense it anyway, despite the result of the CRP test. So this also shows us that if you want to implant, implement these strategies, if you would have actually avoided these stations to have uh, stock, um, likely the impact would even be larger of CRP testing in such a setting. So overall, we conclude from the CRP test that also in low resource settings, uh, this is a very uh, a powerful strategy to implement that if the test is cost less than a dollar and generally the GP is compliant with the result of the test uh, in more than 80% of the cases, this would actually be a cost beneficial um, approach. But it does require also different funding strategies because uh, of the different insurance mechanisms uh, in these countries. Now I want to bring you to another issue that we uh, discovered through the studies that we've done in a global uh, setting. As you all know, when a patient comes to you and you ask the patient, uh, did you take any medicine? And uh, yes, doctor, I took a medicine. I took the red and yellow medicine or the blue pill. And then would you know in that case, what was the drug that the patient had? And if I show this slide, and I've shown this slide with three different capsules, uh, in different uh, settings around the world, also in the USA, with a room full of experts, infectious disease experts around the world. And if I ask them, is the left capsule an antibiotic, or the middle capsule an antibiotic, or the right one, the green and yellow one, actually the majority votes for the last one. And I'm not sure, I cannot do the voting now with you because I'm now actually recording this, but if here above you can see actually what it is. So the left one is tetracycline, the middle one amoxicillin, and on the right the green yellow one is tramadol, a painkiller. So two antibiotics, but two different kinds of antibiotics that actually look quite similar. Um, so what you can see from these results, and we see this more, and this is actually becoming quite a problem, that similar drugs can look different, different drugs can look the same, and actually sort of this recognition and this confusion that made it cause, actually, how is that impacting on antibiotic use? And how does that lead to maybe poor prescription practices or poor dispensing practices? Or uh, how about the, the patient's perception? Or can we use color, for instance, um, to actually help guide people when to, tr to take what kind of drug? And if you want to maybe have antibiotics uh, look less, uh, more uh, like candy, could that help actually nudging the patient not to use antibiotic unless the patient uh, really needs it? So that's a project that we are currently involved in with a very multidisciplinary group, including uh, the industry, to really look at this issue. How does this confusion around 
is this an antibiotic or not? How about the color use? Can you actually use the appearance of drugs to actually help in both dispensing practices but also consumption practices or the usage practices from the patient and see and at what cost does this come and what will be the potential impact. So that is something that we're really quite uh, excited about and um, hope to report on that uh, in the near future. So to wrap up, the whole issue of antibiotic resistance is a very delicate one because as a GP you want the best for your patient. Uh, sometimes you have to also think about a more broader perspective or the future patient that you need to treat. And this balance, this current individual who is right here in front of me versus the future individuals, um, and particularly this is very interesting around the resistance issue, uh, how do we go about it? So this is a very delicate balance and we do need these antibiotics and of course we should not restrict too much. People still need access to antibiotics and we are fully aware of that. Um, and it's quite interesting to look in Europe, and in this map you see that the northern countries um, um, do show that they're somehow quite capable in using antibiotics in a more limited fashion and also as such have a less of a resistance problem as compared to other countries. So this is an example for Staph aureus methicillin uh, resistant. And, and how can we learn from each other? So what are the issues in other countries that lead to more resistance? How about prevention practices? Uh, how about antibiotic consumption patterns? How about the expectations of the patients? How about communication strategies? And we really uh, need to think about how can we really learn and really try to improve and not say, okay, our situation is different and you cannot compare, but try to be open to each other, uh, both from the northern countries, look at what are the issues and why can't maybe our policies apply there or maybe they can, but you need to adapt based on local cultural differences. So we need, have to sort of really have that dialogue and make that impact. So this is a very straightforward picture that does show how antibiotic use and resistance for pneumococcus in this instance um, is related. So that's really antibiotic use, but also generally medical microbiology is quite crucial. I, we do see that in the northern countries also Medical microbiology is very well developed. It are often also medical doctors that run microbiology labs are very engaged with GPs and discussing and thinking about local policies to try to improve uh, the situation. And um, another initiative that we're currently uh, involved in is actually particularly in more the low resource settings, so in Asia or in Africa, where there's limited knowledge of microbiology or when to use what kind of antibiotic or prevention practices or different kinds of policies. We have now a team of recently retired professionals, but also uh, senior professionals who will actually want to use their holidays or spare time or as a, uh, to, to actually, we have now a, a database of these professionals. We um, have a similar way of working and with the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands, uh, these uh, professionals could be sent on a mission. Uh, we recently had one in Armenia uh, to really support local professionals in maybe the Western way or uh, if you have full... Re so what will be the ideal world and what are the simple steps for them regarding prevention, regarding diagnostics or antibiotic use policies to in slow steps to really try to get there. And this is how we use uh, the senior experts who actually have the time uh, to go to these countries and really give uh, support but also when they come back, it's not that the relationship falls apart, so they keep on communicating with each other um, to actually have this sort of help desk role uh, after they have left uh, the country. So that's always a continuous uh, communication. So this is where I would like to end. I hope you have a good discussion and I'm happy to take any questions by email and I can res respond. Um, Another thing I would like to point out is a stewardship course that we have uh, at our institution in May 2020. And the website is uh, mentioned uh, on the slide. Uh, it's a really an international uh, masterclass on stewardship where different aspects from implementation, really straightforward with uh, people from different countries. The last time we did it, it was from 17 different countries and it was a really very great experience that both we learned a lot, but also, uh, of course, the people that came. So. Thank you and uh, look forward to see your response and questions uh, through the email.